it's possible to live our days knowing the promises of God and never receiving all he has for us. To us, the world is foreign, yet it's all we've ever known. Our boundaries are limitless, but we find serenity in a predictable refuge, a place where we control. We've settled for nearsightedness, left blind toward the outside. But there is a stirring within us, a stirring to know more, to experience more, to possess the promise for things yet to come. Fear of the unknown lingers, though nothing else satisfies. The moment lies before us to make the choice. Complacency or pursuit. Behold, it's a new day. The breath of the Almighty fills our lungs and gives us life. Death's shadow is eliminated and our God guides us with His life. We're infused with passion. His promises are within our sight. Though our steps are uncertain, He fails not. Cowards scurry, but we are not weak. We follow our hearts, our convictions, our calling through concealed paths. Doubt lurks, pain intrudes, yet we set our eyes on the prize before us. We may be delayed, but we will not be denied. We will rise. Greater is he who is in us. Creation is no match for the creator. Though the earth moves, we will not be shaken. We advance with a spirit of power. We cling to the truth. We hold fast to his promises. There is no compromise. We give our all to be in His presence, beyond expectation, beyond reproach. Sin, doubt, and familiarity have lost their grip. We endure the sweat of our brow for an unfathomable reward. Those whose hope is in the Lord will not be put to shame. We refuse to waver. We become stronger. We lay it all on the line for this. His promises are yes and amen. To God be the glory. Well, good morning. Man, it is awesome to see this place packed out in the middle of the summer. And uh, man, there's a great energy in here this morning. I, I, there's a couple blessings already that have happened today that I just want to start with. Um, one, during the singing, man, I just got a blessing from the kids singing at the top of their lungs that were around me. That always gets me excited. At the end of that video, the young man right behind me was like, yes. When he got to the top, man, I love that. That is awesome right there. You guys are, are right there picking up on the spirit. Also, I just want to point out a special group that we have with us. Over here is Pastor Mike Shinneberry, and he and his youth group are here from Michigan. They made the long drive down yesterday, and they are here for Teen Extreme this week. Here's what I want you to do. All of you that are going to camp, all of you teenagers, just stand up real quick, okay? They're used to this. Let's give them a very warm welcome this morning. You guys can go ahead and be seated. We're excited to have you, and we need to be praying for them, and we'll, we'll do that at the end of our service. Let's make sure we take some time to pray that God would work in the hearts of this next generation that's coming up through camp this week. We also have a group of our teenagers, uh, 15 of them that left yesterday, and they are in Atlanta on a mission trip this week. So I don't know about you. I'm excited about the future. You know, I'm excited about the next generation that's coming up. God is moving and working in hearts, and so it's great to see all of you here today, all of our kids. I'm just excited to be here this morning, all right? So uh, we're continuing with our series that we started a few weeks ago, Defining Moments, How to Build a Lasting Legacy. Does anybody know what's happening two weeks from today at our church? It's our... There we go. 
And you guys are probably wondering, we're talking about this every week. Yes, I'm going to do it one more time. Two weeks from today, we are going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary. Saturday night, July 8th at 6 p.m. We are having a very special service in here. Brother Walker, our founding pastor, Brother Stewart, who also was part of starting the church and pastored for 25 years. They will both be here that night. We're going to have a question and answer, a dessert reception to follow, and all God's people said about dessert... Oh, man, I love dessert. Okay, anyway, but we'll set that aside. That's Saturday night, Sunday morning. We're having our our services at 9 and 1045. Many special things planned. Just want to remind you of all that's going on, and here is the reason why. 50th anniversary has just had me thinking, like, why is this such a big deal? I think it's good to look back to the past to remember to see God's faithfulness. All through the Bible, you see them building monuments. You see them reminding themselves of God's faithfulness. It's important. But the question that I've really been thinking about this week is, why is this such a big deal? What is the purpose that God has for the church? Can I tell you this morning that that the church has a larger-than-life purpose? We're created for God's glory. We are the light of the world. What we do as a church, what we do as individual Christians has eternal significance. You understand that when we lift high the name of Jesus, when we point people to Christ, when we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus and people put their faith and trust in him, their lives are eternally changed. We understand this morning that we all have a never to die soul and the Bible very clearly teaches that there is a heaven And there's also a hell. There's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other way. And the world needs to know that in spite of our sin and in spite of how lost we are and how undone we are, there is a Savior named Jesus who died so that we could be saved and our lives could be changed, not just in this life, but for all of eternity. You understand we have a larger-than-life purpose. God didn't leave us here in this world to to do this on our own. He gave us his Holy Spirit. He gave us a promise that all power will be given unto you. Take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. God has a huge purpose for us. He wants to show himself in a God-sized way. Can I tell you this morning that his promises are yes and amen to God be the glory for 50 years. This light has been shining in this community for the glory of God. People have been saved. Lives have been transformed. God has shown himself in God-sized ways. And he wants to continue to do the same thing. I got another question before we jump into the heart of where we're going this morning, but how do we maximize the glory of God being seen as a church in our lives individually? I don't know. Sometimes uh, you put things up on the wall and at first they catch your sight, but so often we walk by things every single day and we forget that they're there. That happened to me this week. This week I was standing by the front office and when you come through the main entrance, those two front doors right out behind us, if you look over to the left, you'll notice a big phrase at the top. It just says, create it for glory. And then it has Matthew 5.16 right under it. And Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your that they may see your good works. Everybody say that out loud, that they may see your and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How do we maximize the glory of God? What is our responsibility as his children? Yeah, we love God. We love others. We go into the world. But how we let the light of Jesus shine in us and through us is through good works. And as we think about the next 50 years, I've been reminding us that what we do in our 51st year is just as important as what we did in our first year. And what I'm praying for our church is that that God would give us more compassion for the lost world around us. We all have neighbors. We all have coworkers. We all have family members. We live in the Bible Belt. We live in a wonderful community, but can I tell you that there are multitudes of people outside these doors that are lost this morning right here in our own community. God, give us more of a passion to see people save and more compassion to go with the good news of the gospel. 
And I'm praying that God would give us more mercy. I'm so thankful that we have an addiction recovery program. How many of you believe those people need to be seen and to, 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 to see and to be shown the love and mercy of God? And there are people that are broken and held captive, but God can set people free. I'm thankful that we have an addiction recovery program. I'm thankful for the emphasis that we've been placing on foster care. There are people in this community that need mercy. And I'm praying that God would put inside of our hearts that burning desire. I'm praying that God would give our church a desire to, to, to give with more generosity. One to another. That we'd be a blessing in meeting each other's needs. But not only that, but in reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm praying about big things that we can do over the next 10 years for the cause of Christ. Not just here, but all around the world. And that God would light a fire in us for more generosity. I'm praying that God would give us more of a passion for discipleship. Do you realize we have 720 plus students that are going to get dropped off at our school Every single day, starting in just a little over a month. Sorry for all of you teachers, not to rain on your summer parade. But it's going by fast. Man, I'm thankful again for the teenagers that we have here, the children that we have. I'm thankful for the new people that are being saved. I want our church to have more of a passion for discipleship and to get our hands dirty and to get into the work and throw ourselves wholeheartedly into it because it's not just enough to give them the good news of Jesus. We got to teach them all of his statutes and all of his ways because that's where we find blessing in life. All I'm trying to say this morning is that my prayer for our church is that we will refuse to waver, that we will become stronger in our pursuit of God. That video asked an awesome question. It's been nagging at me all week long. Is it gonna be complacency or is it gonna be pursuit? I think the biggest danger that we face as a church going into our 51st year is complacency. His apathy, his status quo is, man, God's given us so much. We have all of this. But where are we going to break out of those barriers and those walls? And are we going to continue to pursue the more that God has for us? And can I tell you, that leads us exactly to our message for this morning. Our defining moment that we're going to look at and talk about today is never stop. Never stop. I want you to see the context. Look at, um, look at Joshua chapter 13, verse 1. I love this. The Bible is awesome. The Bible can be funny sometimes. I think verse 1 is funny. Look what it says. Now Joshua was old and stricken in years. And the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. Where's all my old people this morning? Where are you? Can I tell you this morning, you are old and stricken in years. I didn't say that. God said that. I mean, I'm just like, wow, okay. That just kind of jumped out at me right off the bat. I mean, he just lays it out there. Joshua, you're old. Joshua's like, I know. Thanks for reminding me. But I love what he says next. Look at the end of that verse. And there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. <laughs> hey, Joshua, you're old and you're stricken in years. But guess what? It's not time to stop. I don't have a retirement village for you. I don't have a golf course and a beachfront house. I'm not asking you to go kick back and take it easy in a cabin on the side of a mountain and just drink your coffee to end your days. No, guess what, Joshua? You are old and you are stricken in years, but there still remaineth very much land to possess. You know what God's telling him? Don't stop, Joshua. Keep moving on. Keep pressing toward the prize. There are things that are bigger and worth living for, and I want to continue to use you in incredible ways for, for my honor and for my glory. So I think right here we have right off the bat in this chapter and in this verse, the moment lies before all of us to make a choice. Is it going to be complacency or pursuit? Let's just jump right into this. I love how this passage unfolds. First thing I want you to see this morning is we never stop receiving. Never stop receiving. The context, I'm not going to take time to read verses two through six again because that was kind of brutal trying to get through all of that just a little while ago. We already read it, but did you notice all the ites and all the big names that were mentioned there? Well, here we have verse one. 
God's telling Joshua he's old, he's stricken in years, but there remaineth yet very much land to possess. And then in verses 2 through 6a, he lists out all of the land that there still is to possess. Now, if you are with me this morning, okay, and you are thinking back to even our context of where we were just last Sunday, the title of our message was A Mission Accomplished. And the last thing that we saw at the end of Joshua chapter 11 was that they conquered the promised land and the land found rest. So you might be sitting here thinking, I thought the wars were over. I mean, I thought that, that it was done. The battle is over. Can I tell you, the, the big battles are over. They had gone in and they broke the back of the enemy. I mean, all of the huge enemies, all of the huge cities, all of the huge giants, they had been conquered. There is now a power vacuum inside the nation of Israel, um, inside the promised land, inside of the land of Canaan. And it's now Israel's job to step into that void and to possess the land. And not just to possess that land, but they're gonna divide. Chapters 13 through 21 is Joshua dividing up the inheritance, okay? It's one of those portions of scripture, as awesome as the first 12 chapters are to read, you get to chapters 13 through 21, and even the most committed Bible readers sometimes are like, oh boy, here we go. There's just a whole lot of names, and I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But what he's doing is he's dividing up the land. He's giving them their possession, and it's up to every single individual tribe to go into the territory that's allotted to them and to conquer any remaining rebellions that are out there and to push the boundaries even further than what was already theirs to maximize all of the blessings that God has that he wants to pour out on these two children. All right, go ahead. Now, just to help you to see what we're talking about, go ahead and put that map up on the screen right now, okay? So here is a map that's really gonna help you to understand. Everybody see the red, okay? The red is what they currently possessed. When they went into the promised land, all of the victories that they had, all the land that they're dividing up, that was theirs. Those are the cities that they had conquered that they did not burn down, okay? So that was currently theirs. Does everybody see the green, The green is what God was talking about in verses 2 through 6a. There remaineth yet much land to possess. All of what's in the green is still yours to go get. All right, so do you understand? How many, that's like double the size of what they have already. That's a lot of land, right? Now, there's two ways that you can look at this this morning. Way number one is this. You could be a pessimistic person and you could say, more work. I mean, come on. We lived in the wilderness, and then we spent seven years conquering the promised land. We talked about that last week. Seven long years of war, and now there's still much land to possess. I mean, if you're Joshua, how many of you think Joshua is exhausted? And if anybody deserves a cabin retreat away and to kick back and to raise cattle or do whatever it is that you like, grow a garden, drink coffee every morning. How many of you think Joshua is the guy that deserves it? I mean, he put up with a lot, right? So you could look at it and you could just say, more work. My head's just hurting thinking about it. I just want a break. How many of you in here can say, okay, that's, that's probably where I would be maybe if I'm being honest. More battles, more fighting. Do any of you ever get up and just say, I I mean, I know what God has for me is great, but it just seems like life is just a constant struggle. It's a constant fight. Sometimes you just get tired. Sometimes you just want to take a break, right? So you could look at it and you could say more work. Or you could look at it and say more blessing. Put that map back up there. Listen, God, you've already given me all of this but you still have all of that left for me? There's more? I mean, I can't believe I'm not in the wilderness anymore. I can't believe the victories that you've already given to me. I can't believe all the incredible things that you've already done. There's more, there's more blessing, and the answer is yes. And not just is there more blessing. Everybody look at verse six. All the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon unto Mizrathoth, Mame, and all the Sidonians. What's he say next? Everybody read that next phrase out loud with me. Them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. Not only does God want to give us more, but he gives us more with the promise that I will also drive them all out. Like, it's already yours. All you have to do is go get it. Take, get out of, 
Get out of the tent. Get out of the comfort zone. Get out there into the world that God has for you. Put one foot in front of the next, and as you continue to walk and pursue Christ, everything that he has for you is just going to come right along with it because God is the one who gives it. You ready for the practical application? Open the gift. I brought a gift with me today. How many of you would like me to open this gift to see what's inside? Okay, I see some kids. I'm going to in just a second, all right? I'm going to open this Brock in just a minute. What good is this gift if I look at it every day and I'm like, sweet, man, I got a big present. This thing is awesome. This is what we do often in our life. We're like, man, God's got really cool things for me. But what good is it if I just look at it and I'm like, this is amazing. But then I just walk out and just leave it. And I go about my day, and I do my own thing, and I come home, and I'm like, man, that gift is cool. It's still sitting here. What good is this gift if I never open it up? It's not any good. It's doing absolutely nothing for me. The only way that this gift becomes my gift, the only way that it benefits me, is if I take the time to open it up. So let's open it up, and let's see what's inside. Oh, man. Oh, Samsung. I'm liking this. All right. Man, I got right here a Samsung 43-inch flat-screen TV. How many of you like getting gifts like this right here? Amen. Yeah, there's some amen. I got a big amen right over there. Man, I like those kind of gifts. I did this on purpose because it reminded me of how crazy we are sometimes in our life and how foolish we can be early on in our marriage. Back in the day, our, our TV that we had broke. When I thought about this story, I'm realizing how old and stricken in years I am because it's kind of funny. Our TV broke, okay? So there was a period of time. I think we were living on Bostic Lane. I think maybe Stuart was born. I'm not even sure if Shepard was born. But all we had was a 13-inch TV, and it was one of those 13-inch TVs that are like this long, you know? It's like that wide and that long, old-school TV. That's all we had. And I watched all of the NBA finals, I'll never forget it, in our living room. And I had to get a kitchen chair and sit at like two feet in front of that TV. And I watched the Lakers win the NBA championship back at the time. I remember that. I think it was even still like Kobe and Shaq when they were together. It's that long ago, okay? So anyway, I watched them win. Well, then after the NBA finals are over in June, I go on a missions trip with our teenagers. And I'm gone. And uh, by the way, between Father's Day and July 1st, Father's Day, my birthday, it's a great time of year. My family takes good care of me. I love it, you know. So I get back from this missions trip. I'm tired, and I walk into my house, and my wife is so excited to surprise me. You know what she had done while I was gone? She went and bought me a brand new TV, and it was our very first flat screen TV. That's how old we are. (laughs) This sounds funny to talk about that stuff, but it was the very first flat screen TV we had. And I walk in the house and she's so excited to see me because I am God's gift to her. No, just kidding. We'll leave that alone. (laughs) She was excited because she needed help with the kids and I was back home. And anyway, no, she wanted to surprise me because she's the wonderful wife that she is. And so I walk in the door, we hug and all that stuff. And she's like, do you notice anything different? And I look over and I see the television. And what do you think I do? Oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. No, you know what I did? I said, oh, I got to put this thing together. I got to figure it out. <laughs> I, I kid you not, this is embarrassing. I'm telling on myself here. I did that. I really did that. And then I caught myself, and I was like, oh, I got a new TV. You know, I was so tired and exhausted. I just wanted to, like, sit down. And, and unbeknownst to me, she even had someone come and hook it up and get it all programmed and everything like that. And, you know, I'm confessing my sins this morning before you. I'm helping you to realize how you need to pray for my wife and the things that she has to deal with. But I also was reminded about the foolishness of that as I was thinking about this passage and what we so often do as Christians. God has incredible gifts for us. He's got absolute blessings he wants to pour out in our lives, but often we look at them and we're like, ugh. You want me to go serve others? You want me to tell people about Jesus? You want me to fight my flesh? You want me to forgive? You want me to do this? This is hard work, but can I tell you, on the other side of the hard work is unbelievable blessings. Put that map back up one more time. I want you to see this just one more time. This is a perfect picture of American Christianity. We are here, and we are in the red 
And man, we are totally fine with complacency, just like the children of Israel were. Man, God, you've given us so much. You know what I want? I want my house, I want my land, and I want my comfort. Yeah, I love the fact that you're my God and I got that power with me. I'm your person, but as far as going and conquering more land and going after all that you have for me, no, I'm content with what I have. But can I tell you something? Can I give you the spoil alert? What comes right after the book of Joshua? Judges. And you know, Judges is the very next generation. It's the children of Joshua and Caleb and the people that went into the promised land. And guess what happens? They don't conquer the green land. The enemies, the Philistines, did you see them show up in here? The Philistines become the arch enemy, the nemesis of the children of Israel that you find all throughout the Bible. And they end up losing some of that red land because they did not pursue everything that God had for them. And you can kick back and you can say, but God, I have this, I'm just gonna be content. And God says, no, I have created you for more and I want to bless you and I never stop giving and guess what when we open up this gift we just find out that there's more to come and I could do this game forever where you open it up and open it up and open it up but that is the point of who our God is never stop receiving it's not work it's the path to blessing to true fulfillment to true satisfaction in life so open the gift Take what God has for you. The second thing I want you to see this morning is never stop focusing. Never stop focusing. All right, everybody look at verse 15. Joshua chapter 13. Everybody look at verse 15. It says in verse 15, follow along as we read. It says, and Moses gave unto the tribe of the children of Reuben. What's that very next word? Inheritance, inheritance according to their families. How many of you like that word inheritance? How many of you are very neutral about that word inheritance because you're like, ah, it's not much of one coming. <laughs> I tell my kids they got a spiritual inheritance they can step into one day. Oh, that word inheritance, it sounds pretty awesome. I mean, by the way, it shows up 50 times in chapters 13 through 21, okay? So we've got the idea that God has more for us. Well, once we start seeing all that God has for us and we never stop receiving, then we cannot lose our focus on the inheritance, on what God actually wants to give us. And by the way, it's an inheritance. This land was not won in battle by their own strength. Who fought the battle for them? God did. God drove out the inhabitants of the land. Their strength was weak, but when they relied on God and they stepped into the battle, God gave unbelievable victory after victory. So the land was not won in battle by their own power. It was not purchased by their own wealth. It was given to them 100% by God. Now, I'll say one more thing, and then I'm going to jump into where I want to go with this. Chapters 13 through 21, the details, I was talking about that earlier, the details of that might seem boring to you. But how many of you, if you had 11 siblings, Okay, there's 12 of you. Now you would just say, well, that's a whole lot of people. Yes, okay, that is. But if you had 11 siblings and you had an unbelievably wealthy father and it was time to divvy up the inheritance, how many of you would sit there and be very intrigued by everything that was being read in the will and testament? Okay, so that is what chapters 13 through 21 are. For the children of Israel, they're sitting on the edge of their seats because they are getting their prize. They are getting their inheritance that's being given to them directly from God. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through these chapters and as you read through them in your own personal Bible studies. That's what's happening here. They're being handed their portion from God himself. Two practical applications from chapter 13 I gotta point out. Number one is this, get off the border Get off the border. Everything from verse eight through the rest of chapter 13 is all about the two and a half tribes that settled on the eastern side of the Jordan River, okay? That did not enter into the promised land. Look at verse 15, for instance. It says, and who gave? Moses gave. All right, look at verse 24. It says, and Moses gave. And then look down at verse 29. It says, and Moses gave. Uh, if you've been with us through the book of Joshua, you know that Moses died at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, and the promised land is all about Joshua, and when you get to chapter 14, it's going to be Joshua dividing up the inheritance. Two and a half tribes chose their inheritance on the other side of the Jordan River. Let me ask you a quick question this morning. How many of you think that the children of Israel on the other side of the Jordan River sold themselves short? I think they did. 
I mean, you see that in Moses' reaction because they asked for the land and Moses flipped out at first, but he went before God. And you know, there's a very powerful thing that we need to remember, a verse that scares me in Psalm 107. It says, the Lord gave them the desires of their heart, but sent leanness into their souls. God's gonna give us our desires. But sometimes if, if what we want is different than what God wants, he may allow us to have it, even though he tries to stop us from taking it, but we might find that it's not what we really want in the long run. And here you have the two and a half tribes and all of their land that they settle on the other side. And can I tell you, God is good even in spite of ourselves and he still blesses them. As you read through chapter 13, you will find that he reminds them of the great victories that they had over two kings, Sihon and Og. You're gonna find in verse 22, a mention about a man named Balaam. Balaam's one of my favorite people in the Bible. He is an interesting man, or one of my favorite stories, not one of my favorite people, because he was not a good man. Balaam was hired by Og, king of the Moabites, and he was hired by him to curse the children of Israel. He was a soothsayer, and every time he tried to curse the children of Israel, a blessing would come out. Okay, God told him not to go and curse the children of Israel, but Balaam was offered a whole lot of money, so he sold out, and he eventually went. His donkey talked to him. It's a great story. I'm not making it up. Go read it. His donkey spoke to him and said, you're crazy. There's an angel in front of us. That's why I'm stopping in the middle of the road. Well, that's kind of shocking. Balaam still goes on. You know what he does? He convinces Og, the king of the Moabites, to have the children of Israel become friends with the Moabites. And as a result, they fall into terrible adultery and sin and fornication. And God sends a plague that, that wipes out thousands of people in the children of Israel. And you know what he does? He reminds them in this passage that Balaam was killed when you went into battle because in spite of our unfaithfulness and in spite of our failures, God is still good. And by the way, even in spite of our sin, God is greater than our sin and God still provides victory over our sin. There's some great lessons here. God still blesses, but the problem is this. He blessed them, but they settled for less than their best. Can I tell you two, a couple things that happened to these two and a half tribes? Number one, they were on the east side of the Jordan River and they were in the most vulnerable bold position. And years later, when the Babylonians come in, guess who are the first two tribes to go? Them. You know what else happened? They easily got cut off from their national identity because they had the Jordan River in between them and all of the worship and the temple and the sacrifices and they quickly lost their national identity and they just got swept away and blended in with the rest of the world and you don't hear much about the half tribe of Manasseh and Reuben and Gad, you just don't because they quickly got swept away because they settled for less than God's best. Here's what we have to remember, Psalm 47, four, when we're talking about getting off the border, let God choose for you. Psalm 47, four says this. He shall choose our inheritance for us. Of Jacob, whom he loved, Selah. Here's where we gotta get. We gotta get to the point where we want what God wants for us more than we want what we want for us. We've got to be in a place of total and complete surrender. It's not about what looks good and appealing to me. And it's not about selling myself short. It's about dying to all of that and just simply saying, God, you choose my inheritance. You choose where I live. You choose where I go. Because whatever it is that you have for me is far greater than anything that I could ever have for myself. And I challenge you teenagers and you young people as you go to camp this week, let God choose for you. Surrender your life and your will to him and let him speak to you. Let him guide and direct your steps. Want that more than you want anything else. Get off the border. Got enough border Christians. Get off the border. Get fully in. Pursue what God has for you. And if we're going to never stop focusing, Christ is my treasure I'm just going to point this out really quick. Four times in these chapters, the Levites are mentioned. Look at verse 14. I'll just show you what verse 14 says. Only unto the tribe of Levi he gave none inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said unto them. And then verse 33, I just want you to see this too. But unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. Why did God not give them an inheritance of land? Why was their inheritance God himself and in serving him? Well, their job was to live among the people, 
Their job was to teach the law of God. Their job was to remind the nation of Israel why they existed as a nation. Practically speaking, they didn't get an inheritance in land because he wanted them to be fully devoted to him. He didn't want them to be sidetracked about the battles that came with the cares of this life, about conquering their land and possessing their land and developing their land. He didn't want them to be sidetracked by that at all. He wanted them to be spearheading the encouragement behind all of God's people that, hey, Go get the land that God has for you. Obey God's statutes. He's going to bless you. They were the encouragers. They were the reminders to everybody else to keep pursuing the prize. Don't become comfortable. Don't become complacent. But metaphorically speaking, they were also the living full reminder that God himself wasn't just the treasure of the Levites, but the treasure of every single tribe of the nation of Israel. It was never really about the land, and it was never about living in peace and in harmony. It was about letting the world know and see who God is and how great he is. That's what it was all about. And they were to live in such a way that, we, that the children of Israel wouldn't get comfortable and complacent but that they would say, God has more. God has more. I want what God has for me, not what I want for me. And they would go and they would pursue it. I'm so glad that we sung Christ our treasure this morning. He's the ultimate pursuit of our life. I was thinking about that, that song and I was thinking about that chorus, grace for the guilty, strength for the weary, healer of sickness, fountain of goodness, faithful provider, gracious redeemer, mighty in power, awesome in splendor, author, perfecter, keeper, sustainer. You know what our hearts desire? That, all of that, no matter what we accomplish in life, no matter what, how rich we get, no matter how many more possessions we get, no matter if we get the house of our dreams, the job of our dreams, the family of our dreams, in all of that, we are still in a sin-cursed world and we're still gonna be fighting battles. And can I tell you, the richest people in the world are getting up this morning and they're still looking for hope and they're still looking for healing and they're still looking for mercy and forgiveness and grace. And you know who has all of that? Christ does. And as we come to church as individuals, hungry and desperate for Christ, and as we find healing, and as we find forgiveness, and as we find grace, and as we find mercy, then corporately together, we have that to extend to a world that's in desperate need of it. Christ is our treasure. And I tell you, every Sunday, if I could beg our church as we think about our future, come seeking Christ. Come seeking Christ. I want to say it again, come seeking Christ. Don't come looking for a great message because I'm sorry, I know the preacher really well and it's not always going to happen every single week. Hey, don't come see, uh, seeking your favorite type of music and your favorite type of songs because guess what? That is absolutely impossible to do in a group this size. Can I tell you what can happen if we come seeking Christ and if his name is lifted on high, which I promise you before God, as long as I live and as long as I breathe, that's my only heart's desire for this church is for people to see Jesus. That's it. Everything else is just fluff on the side. I just want people to see Christ. And if we come seeking Christ, everything else will be frivolous. Everything else won't matter. And you know what? We will find him and he will speak to our hearts and we will have a unity and a passion that we can take forward into this world for his honor and for his glory. That's what it's about. We can't stop. We cannot stop pursuing Christ. That's our treasure. That's our goal. That's our aim. And if we ever lose sight of that, we're going to lose long before we win. What we do in our 51st year is just as important as what you do in your first year. You start and plant a church because you have a burning desire for Christ to be seen. As we go into our 51st year, I have a burning desire for Christ to continue to be seen. And can I tell you, it is so contagious to see people coming to Christ and getting saved and their lives being changed, to see a packed out auditorium, to see God moving and working in lives in ways that only he can. Christ is our treasure. Never stop focusing on what matters. And last but not least, never stop asking. You may be wondering why in the world we went to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and I want you to turn over there. And here's how I want to end our service this morning. I'll, I'll, I want us to end with a time of prayer. And I went to Jabez this, Jabez this morning. 
I went to Jabez. This, J, why do I keep calling him Jabez? Jabez this morning. Because to me, he is a person that perfectly sums up the essence of the never stop spirit of what God's telling Joshua here in Joshua chapter 13. Hey, you are old and stricken in years, but guess what? There's still much land to be possessed. Jabez shows up in, a, in the Chronicles. You want to talk about another really tough passage of scripture to read? It's the, it's the book of Chronicles. And they're just going through a whole list of names and who was begotten by who. And all of a sudden, they stop at this man named Jabez. And they draw a little bit of attention to who he is. And you know what they say about Jabez? Well, you know what I want to tell you about Jabez? Jabez was born in dark times. And Jabez had less than the best start in life. Do you know what his name means? He calls his pain. His mom named him he calls his pain. That's the start that he had in life. He lived during the time of the judges. It was a dark time in the nation of Israel, but somewhere along the line, Jabez got a hold of who God was and the promises that God had for him. And you know what he prays here in verse 10? Go ahead and put that verse up on the screen. Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. He gets up and he says, God, what I want more than anything else is I want you to bless me. I want you to put your divine favor on my life. It's, it's what we were talking about just a minute ago when we're talking about get off the border, let Christ choose for you. That's, that's what Jabez is after. Whatever you want from me, God, however you want to bless me, wherever you want me to live, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, God, I just want your blessings. You know what we need to pray every day of our lives? God, bless me. God, bless me. I want your divine favor. I don't want what I want. I want what you want. So not only that, put the next thing up there. God, bless me. The next thing he says is, God, grow me. Grow me. He says, next, he says, oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast. At some point, he looked at everything that God had given him. and He said, man, you've given me so much. And you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to share it with others. This wasn't a selfish prayer about more land and more possessions for him. This was a prayer about, I want more because I want more influence and I want more people to invest in. I want to take all that you've given to me and I want to share it with others. God, enlarge my coast. That should be the prayer of us individually. Has God blessed you? Has he blessed our church? God, enlarge our coast. Man, I want other people to know how good you are and how great you are. I want other people to experience the forgiveness that I have, the mercy that I have. God, give us more people to influence for your honor and glory. And then next he says, and that thy hand might be with me. <laughs> this is where we feel that overwhelm. Man, God's been good and he's blessed us and he gives us gifts. And we want God to enlarge our coast. Then all of a sudden we're like, oh, Man, that's a big battle. That's a God-sized step of faith. I don't know how this is going to happen and how this is going to take place. You know, we say, God, enable me. Who do we have living inside of us? We have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. I guarantee you God wants to be seen in God-sized ways. And when he starts to bless us and when we ask for the right way to have our coast enlarged, to have our influence expanded for his honor and for his glory, it's going to feel big and it's going to feel impossible and it's going to feel overwhelming. And that's exactly where God wants every one of us to be because he wants us to get on our knees and say, God, enable me. Empower me to do what you've created me to do. And then the last thing he says, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. He realized the only thing that could rob him of God's blessing, God's influence, God's power, was sin that could creep into his own heart and into his own life. That was it. Only he could get in the way of what God wanted to do in and through them. You know what our prayer needs to be? God, protect me. Protect me from evil. Protect me from sin. Protect my testimony. Protect my name, not for my name's sake, but for your name's sake. God, protect our church. Protect our testimony. Can I tell you, to God be the glory for 50 years, he has guarded the reputation and name and testimony of this church. I want that to increase and to continue on, and we got to get on our faces before God, and we got to ask him to protect us in that type of a way, because as we expand and as we continue to grow and move forward for God's honor and for God's glory, make no mistake about it, the enemy is going to be powerful, and he's going to be strong and he's going to try to thwart God's work. The only thing that can get in the way is us becoming complacent, 
losing sight of what it's really truly all about. We as a church are at a defining moment. Are we just gonna become comfortable or are we gonna never stop? I want you to leave that slide up on the board and I wanna ask you to stand to your feet right now and I wanna ask you to fill these altars. Get your wife, get your children, get somebody around you. If you can't come physically down here, stay in your seats, but let's take a few minutes and let's pray this prayer together as a church that he would continue to bless with his divine favor, that he would grow us. Let's pray this together as a church as we close our time and our service here this morning.